Well, we want to continue on with our study of the first letter that the Apostle John wrote. We're over in uh, chapter 2, and we were ending up toward the latter part of verse 17, our last time together. So thankful everybody can be here and appreciate the message we just heard. Uh, John, in effect, is uh, spending a lot of time here really dealing with what John, Jonathan was quoted a while ago, John 8. 31 and 32, if you continue in my word. Uh, that is basically what he's been saying through these first uh, uh, words we've been studying here and throughout the epistle, if you continue my word. I might say that if you continue, implies that you may not. But if you do, then you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. So when we come down in the way John's doing this, here, I want to remind you that he was dealing with the very early false doctrine, heresy, of uh, Gnosticism. And we won't go back over that. We did quite a while, uh, spent some time on it at the beginning of the study. But one of the things that he's doing here is showing at the end of verse 17 that the flesh has really nothing to offer ultimately. It doesn't make any difference how well that you are uh, physically you're going to die the Lord doesn't come back first in the case it's going to be a great transition from the material to the non-material and most people don't think that way but even that's not the end of it because Hebrews 9 27 says that after death then comes the judgment and Paul talks about we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that we might give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Well, John is mindful of these people to whom he's writing of remaining faithful. They can't do that. They don't continue in the word. Because faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word. And it must be an active, obedient word. For Christ is the author of the eternal salvation. And do all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 9. And when we come to the latter part of verse 17, he is finishing uh, contrasting the present world, it's material, it's physical, that is governed by time and space, and all the laws of nature, uh, then over and against the spiritual. Notice this world passes away, and with it all things that govern it, thus the lust, the appetites, will also go with it. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So there's where the emphasis is. Again, that harkens back to John 8, 31, if you continue in my word. So that's what John's interested in because he wants their joy to be full, verse 4 of chapter 1. Their joy is full when they know they're in fellowship with God, just as the apostles are in fellowship with God. Thus, they must be forearmed against any false doctrine, and especially the one in which he has in mind here. So when we come down to verse 18, he addresses them as he did at the beginning of chapter 2, when he said, little children, saying, we word in fact, the children. It's the last time. Now you can read over that in a hurry if you want to, but we won't get out of the point. It's made, and you might be troubled if you say, well, what does he mean the last time? Now, there are different, different views on this. Some think, well, he's talking about the last time before the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, or it's talking about the last time before Christ returns. Well, I don't think either one of those fits the bill. It's out of context. In other words, it's not the literary environment that John is creating here. He's not talking about that. Now, if you go to the American Standard, uh, you will see that it's not time, but hour. It's the last hour. And I want to bring out something here. And I, again, don't necessarily want to get that technical, but it's like the word love in English. We have one that translates uh, four different words in the Greek. And we have the same thing here. Um, there are, in other words, different uh, various Greek words used in the New Testament to indicate time. And there's one, kairos, which is time contemplated with reference to certain events. There, There is... Um, Hora is time referenced to um, a fixed 
date or period. And that's important to understand. This chronos, and you think of chronometer or whatever with your chronos, and that's the time with reference to duration or succession. It's important to understand uh, those things. And yet when the English translators were reaching for something in English to say what was said in Greek by the Holy Spirit, then uh, they didn't know or couldn't, they limited, but they could not find any more than the word P-I-M-E, time. And I think that you'll see that as you look at this particular word, this designates time, um, uh, we would say an indefinite period or a definite period. Um, it fits, and again, we don't look, we don't want to look at this standing alone. We've got to consider the rest of what the Bible teaches when it says these things, the remote context, in other words, as well as the immediate context, which you're in right now, as John writes. What fits it better than anything else is the Christian age. That time in which God is dealing with man through Christ and his authority in the gospel, it's that, it's that time. Uh, when this time is over, that age, and it's instinct, we don't know when it's going to end. Then when that's over, then the end of the world comes. Only God knows that. Even Jesus on earth said that nobody knows when time's going to end except the Father. So the thing we need to understand is that he's dealing with false doctrine. We've got to remember he's addressing that false doctrine in the context with which, in which he writes. And so when he says the last time, it's the last dispensation in which God will deal with man which also means it's the last dispensation in which God offers forgiveness of sin. And when that's over, there is not going to be another aid or dispensation when salvation be offered. At the end of the Christian age, it's the end of all things material. I think it's interesting that he puts this in verse 18 right here, just after he finishes saying the world passes away and the lust thereof and he that doeth but he that doeth the will of God abides forever little children you're near and dear to me I want you to be full of the joy that God wants his people his children to have I want you to be faithful I want you to escape false teachers I want you to recognize them it's the last days it's the last time and ye, and as you have heard now this means you've already heard what i'm about to write and as you have heard that antichrist well antichrist anti in the greek means over and against opposed to sometimes it can mean even in the place of uh i think it could mean all here antichrist um, he's against Christ, but he's more than against Christ. He is in the place of Christ. So you've heard that Antichrist will come. Well, when did they hear? Well, again, don't forget what you've learned in the rest of the scriptures. One good place to go to immediately, first, first Timothy chapter four, a lot of time, son, you child depart from the faith. Another step, a lot of time, a lot of time, some shall depart from the faith. Giving heed to seducing demons, doctor, devil, and so on. So you've heard of that. Well, where would they have heard it? Through any faithful evangelist, and certainly from the apostle. So you've heard that'll be. It's not, it shouldn't catch you by surprise. You've already heard about it. So then he says, at the time of this writing, even now are there many antichrists. Well, now let's think for a moment. He says singular antichrist, that antichrist shall come. But now he makes it plural. So what's he talking about? Notice before I get to that and answer that question, he ends the verse by saying, whereby in the light of what I just told you, 
we know that it's the last time. Because these things will take place in the last dispensation of time. And of course, that's the time in which Christ reigns through the gospel over the church. He's the head of the church. He has all authority in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, 18. So now back to Antichrist. If you put these things together of what you have elsewhere, he's headed for a particular person. But usually that particular person doesn't just show up tomorrow when he wasn't completely unheard of today. In other words, there would be those who would evidence the spirit of the one who he calls the Antichrist. Well, we know we've already seen from many scriptures, and John will repeat himself here. Uh, Peter talks about it. Paul does. Uh, that people will depart from the faith. Uh, they get they depart from the faith because they're just the false doctrines, producing spirit doctrines of devil. And they speak lies and hypocrisy. John has a lot to say about that, doesn't he? When it comes down to lies, that which is contrary and against the truth. So when he talks about that, he's talking about there would be a growth and development of these things. We have often pointed out that by the year 150 AD, that there was already departure from the teaching of the New Testament regarding the elders. That by then, in the congregations, there had one man been selected out of the eldership to have more power than the rest of the out, uh, elders. Now, in time, I say, again, in time, this would grow into where they would designate that one man bishop and make a distinction between the term bishop and elder. And that term bishop would be having here any more power and finally, they would be in this not that long, as far as history is concerned, the Metropolitan Bishop. In other words, let's just take the Houston area, the fourth largest metropolitan area in the whole country. Well, you would have then one man who would be the bishop over all the churches. You want to think of the Houston Metropolitan area. And that's what they did. And uh, we could go into more of that, but we won't do that now. If you're going to study church history, first 300 years after the first century, you see that. But it was already beginning. We don't know who Diotrephes was. John will deal with him later on in other epistles. But he had such power is that he would not even receive messengers from John, and he uh, kicked out of the church whoever he would. Well, one man can't do that except that people think he has the authority to do it, and they let him do it. So already these things are, are showing, and I think that's what he means. He says uh, that there are many antichrists, and that evidence is something to you. He says, in view of the teaching you receive, and in view of what's going to be in this one person in Christ, already that spirit's moving. Remember how Paul warned the Ephesian elders that after my departure, Grievous wolves entering among you, not sparing the flock, and that from among your own selves shall men arise, teaching perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Well, that was many years before John wrote this letter. So they have been being warned all the way through this time period. And I think it's interesting that uh, church history, secular church history, has John over in Ephesus in that area before he's exiled to Patmos and where he received the revelation that we know is the book of Revelation. But notice how he describes them. They would be the antecedent of these antichrists. They went out from us. They went out from us. Well, that first of all implies they had to be a part of us. <laughs> And think of the context in which John's writing this. He wants them to recognize this particular error and know it for what it is. Error, a lie. They are opposed to Christ. 
Also remember that when Christ was on earth, he warned in Matthew 24 that many would arise, even before the such in Jerusalem, claiming to be Christ. And because of that, many would go out and follow them during the destruction. So uh, they went out from us. That us would be not only the uh, members of the church, but John and any of the apostles. But they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt continue with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, that they were not all of us. If you're abiding in the doctrine of Christ, and you might want to read Second John here. If you're abiding in the doctrine, the teaching of Christ, the authority of Christ, the only way you can abide in it is to be obedient to his will. Hey, John said, do you think about that? Well, he certainly has. He's been talking about the importance of embracing and, in, and, and obeying the truth and recognizing the difference between a lie and the truth. A lie is a falsehood. It is of the devil. It deceives. Well, they already know the truth. Remember, these people are Christian. These people are at different stages of growth and development. He's already dealt with that earlier, and we emphasized it in their maturity or the lack thereof. But what he's saying is aimed at everybody, whether you were baptized yesterday or you've been a member of the church 20 years or you're aged in your practice of the truth as a father or whatever. They know these things. You cannot preach like Paul told Timothy and Titus to preach and not know these things about the truth and about that which is contrary to the truth. So if they leave us, they're leaving us, according to John, by embracing error. Think about it for a moment. You can't leave being faithful to the Lord in his spiritual body, which is the church, except that you engage in sin and won't repent of it. Or, as he has here, you embrace a false doctrine. And that's what Paul said they would do. They would be seduced by doctrines of devils. And notice he even talks about them uh, in that same book. He talks about them having each of his. They weren't happy with the truth. They didn't love the truth. He talks about, as we mentioned sometime back, the Thessalonians and a great falling away that would take place. What must precede that? Well, they wouldn't love the truth. Well, what about them? They had pleasure in unrighteousness. Maybe that's hard for us to understand, but people can love error. People can have pleasure in righteousness. So this is what he's got in mind here. They went out from us. Why did they do that? And how did they do it? They went out from us because they embraced the false doctrine. It must fit the context that he's writing. And what is it? We're well, talking about Gnostic. So a Gnostic is Antichrist. Well, Antichrist is going to come. You've heard about that. And already it's happened. Some are evidencing the spirit of the one who's against Christ and would actually usurp the place of Christ. Now, if you begin to look throughout the scriptures uh, at the man of sin, this man, of course, it would be many years and out of the apostasy would form the Roman Catholic Church. And in time, the so-called, quote, vicar of Christ, unquote, would come to be. Well, he is putting himself in the place of God. To this very day, when the Roman Pope sits on what they call the throne of St. Peter and speaks, quote, ex cathedra, unquote, that's God speaking. And they have long said, Lord God, the Pope. People don't maybe recognize all that unless you are a Roman Catholic and have been catechized very well. They know it, and they don't apologize for it. And so that's where we're heading here. And it would be out of the apostasy of the church, all these false doctrines that arose over the first um, 300 years thereabouts, that out of that would come Roman Catholicism. And the first pope, of course, where they acknowledge uh, him to be uh, the superior of all the metropolitan bishops would be then the see of Peter, as they would call it, in Rome. And that caused a great uh, dissension among 
the Catholic. Catholic just means universal. So when you've got a Roman Catholic church, that means you're acknowledging that the Bishop of Rome has authority over all the other bishops. Well, the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, wouldn't accept that. And they have to this day. They have patriarchs, and they embrace about everything else, each one of them, each each church does, as far as icons and their basic sacraments and all those things. But they wouldn't accept uh, the chief apostle as they view Peter, which nothing was ever said in the New Testament about Peter being a chief apostle. But that's the way they look at it. And so if Peter was assigned the Bishop Creek of Rome and he's the chief apostle, then whoever succeeds to the Bishop of Rome, he's the chief man. He's inherited it. So God speaks through him. Right? And he speaks in his official capacity as the Pope of the Catholic Church. That's God speaking. And when he in the councils that he calls, meets together to determine certain matters, and when they decide that, that's scripture. That's the reason the Catholic Bible, you can find footnotes through it, where um, they will have here this council said thus and so in such and such time. Well, the reason that's there is because usually there's a passage of Scripture that stands in direct contradiction to what they're doing. But they look at Scripture, uh, they look at their decisions, Pope and Council, as being just authoritative in any book in your Bible. That's how they keep the church modern, so to speak. So anyway, uh, all that's important. John sees this coming. And John wants these people to know it, and he wants them to see eventually that's where it's going to head. Now, the Gnostics at this time, when you study church history after this, you'll see they had a great influence on the church of prophetizing. They're already on here. Uh, it already started even before John wrote. Very early indications of it. They found in the book of Colossians that Paul dealt with, but it probably wasn't known at that time as it was beginning to be known here. So uh, they went out from us. Well, today, how do we know when somebody goes out from the faithful brethren? Well, they either get engaged in sin and walk away and rather than repent, or else they embrace false doctrine. Well, how do we know a doctrine is false? It's the same way people that day and time knew a doctrine was false. If you can know the book, and you understand it, and that's what it was given for, you know. It wasn't getting to hide anything. It was getting to enlightenment, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, James 1, 25. Then you can recognize the difference. Somebody comes along and says, baptism does not save you. Peter says, baptism does. Which you going to believe? Who's his false teacher? Well, if he says, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, then he's gone out from us on that point. And so it is on so many other things. Somebody says, well, uh, you don't have to observe the Lord's Supper in the assembly of worship assembly of the saints on the first day of the week. But you don't have any authority at all in the New Testament, no record of it being observed any other time than in the worship assembly of the saints on the first day of the week, Act 27. Add to that 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Uh, also add to it, there was an apostle present, the very apostle who taught them the gospel. He waited seven days so the church would come together to meet so he could meet with them. And his faith will be there. And thus, that's what they did. Well, somebody says you don't have to. You take it on Thursday night. Who, who left us? Well, on that point, they, they've departed from us. They've gone out from us. They've left the doctrine of Christ. And, of course, it's going to be interesting when you get over here in uh, Second John, and he's saying very plainly that very, very thing. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not the doctrine of Christ. And American Sanders says, whosoever goeth onward and abideth not the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine, hath both the Father and the Son. Does that sound like First John? Certainly it does. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Second John 9 through 11. Now, do you think that had any application to the things we're talking about here? John basically saying here in 1 John 2 and verse 18 uh, what he says in three verses in 2 John. He's saying apply that principle and you'll know who's right and who's wrong. In fact, you'll know whether you're right or whether you're wrong. So they went out from us, but they were not of us. Well, if they had been of us, 
uh, they would have no doubt have continued with us. But they went out. Why did they go out? Manifest, because they might be made known or revealed that they were not all of us. When a person embraces error, they're saying, I'm not one of you. That's not only true when it comes, and of course, especially true when it comes to Christians, members of the Lord's church. But think about that when it comes down even to, um, well, let's just take uh, being a good American. Uh, when people go against the Constitution of the United States, deny what it says, ignore it, violate the rule of law, elevate themselves personally or others above the rule of law, I suggest you they can call out from as Americans. If we can understand that, then why not the kingdom of Christ? How do you go out from it? Well, when a citizen embraces that with the commentary of the Queen's Constitution, he's gone out. John says, therefore, you know who they are. They may say they're not. They may say they're the uh, best things that slice bread when it comes to church, but they're not. Uh, they're not at all. How do you know that? Well, Jesus laid the ground rule for that when he was on earth. By their fruits, ye shall know them. No wondering about it. They're wrong. People don't like to talk in those, uh, that terminology. But John started that uh, as soon as he got into the letter. Notice what he says in verse 2 of chapter 2. And he is the propitiation, speaking of Christ, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now watch. He that saith, I know him, and keep up not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in it. Now, he's applying that to the very reason he wrote this letter, and that is to these antichrists. They've gone out from us because they weren't of us. They went out from us because they embraced doctrine, contrary to Christ. And thus, they let you know they're not one of us. Well, yeah, but they say they are. They're president of this great college, and they're president or head of this school, or they're some elder from another congregation, or editor of a paper. Well, that doesn't make any difference in what they are. But they're teaching false doctrine. That's what they are right there. Thus, they're anti-Christ. So the spirit of all that was developing before the true anti-Christ ever even came to on his throne, so to speak. Then he says something that needs a little more discussion. And that's verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Now, let me take the latter part of that verse first. And ye know all things. Well, now you know they didn't know everything that was being known. If they had, they wouldn't need this letter. That's a very common. The letter is written to enlighten them. Well, know all things means as it relates to why I'm writing in the first place. And about this false doctrine. You know. You know about that. Well, what is it that they know? And how did they come to know it? We forget sometimes, it was mentioned by Jonathan tonight in the devotion call, that they had those miraculous gifts in the early church. The apostles had all nine of them. They're listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, plus one. Each apostle could lay hands on a member of the church and impart a miraculous gift. What was the purpose of the miraculous gift? You almost can look at the list of gifts and tell what the purpose was. They were to enlighten the members of the church in lieu of a completed, written down New Testament. So they were of that temporary period during the first century while the New Testament was being revealed. Now John right here is writing from the books of the New Testament. Paul in writing 1 Corinthians in which he deals with these things was writing part of the New Testament. So they had the wherewithal to recognize error in what he's talking about here. I have no doubt this unction of the spirit is a, is, a, is a miraculous gift. That's how they even know things. That's the purpose of the gifts is so they could know those things. So he makes the statement, you have an unction from the Holy One. We don't have an unction from the Holy One. 
they did. I can't write a Bible. They did. When people sometimes today want to debate and affirm that miracles continue, even as Christ did and the apostles did and so forth, well, they have to read a lot of Bibles. Why I depend upon 2,000 year old books, and that's the newest part of the Bible, the New Testament, to know anything is you've got the Spirit working in you as it worked in the first century. Why depend on a, a, a book to have to read? You would have it. And yet all those people that contend for modern day miracles as the apostles did, uh, they had to read from their Bible. So they had, John reminds them, ye have an unction from the Holy One. That's how you know all things relative to the subject I'm discussing with you. I would like to know how that works. I, I uh, wish sometimes I could I could have something like that to be able to recognize things. Uh, Paul, he tells Timothy, don't neglect that gift. So I know it's under the power of the will of each person who had one. And then you see it can be abused because it took a letter from the Holy Spirit through Paul to the church at Corinth to correct them on their abuse and misuse of miraculous gifts. I don't quite understand how that works, but I can accept the facts of what the Bible says. That's the Holy Spirit himself through Paul regulating the very gifts he put into each individual in the church at Corinth through the laying on of the apostles' hands. So once it's once something is delivered, then many times you have to go back and look at it again. That's what happened with uh, the revealing of the New Testament originally in the first century. Thus, Paul would ask Timothy when he came to him, to bring the parchments, to bring the scrolls. He would study, he could very well study the very thing the Lord revealed to him through a miracle, through inspiration, or through revelation. So you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Well, that tells me that since we have the Holy Spirit's own sword in our possession today, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, and Paul wrote plainly to the Ephesians, when you read what I wrote, you can understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. And then we're taught to study the show ourselves of truth unto God, workmen that needed not to be ashamed, right and divine word of truth. Or we're told to uh, look in the perfect law of liberty, and he that continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, James 1.25, then God anticipated a time when there wouldn't be any miraculous gifts any longer. And that time would be when there would be the totality of the New Testament written down and completed. Well, we have that today. So the truth of the matter is, we have the product of those that had the unctions of the Spirit, whether it was an apostle or one who uh, they laid hands on, such as Luke or James or somebody like that. So they had the wherewithal. Now, what does that say about us? We have the wherewithal too, through the work that God by the Holy Spirit did in them. So he says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lies of the truth. Again, this harkens back to the fact you're anchored in the truth yourself. You have before you what it takes to live the Christian life. You have the will of God concerning Christian living. In other words, they had what it took to become a Christian. They had the organization of the church. They had the worship of the church. They had the mission of the church. All these things they had revealed to them. Not only that, they still had the unction of the Spirit so that they could know the truth. And therefore, they had the will to put it into practice. I don't think we recognize that, as I've already alluded to, uh, in the days of miraculous gifts. They had to will to use them and use them correctly and benefit from them. Or else why did Paul tell them they don't neglect the gift? So it could be neglected. And it sounds like to me in verse 20, that's what John's saying to them. You've got the wherewithal to recognize these things. You've been taught. Now employ it and use it. Then he says, I've not written, I'll read it again. I've not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it and that no lies of the truth. Now think of what Jonathan said in the end of his lesson with John 8, 31, which we started this study. Tonight on that. 
If you continue in my word, then be my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we come on down and see in verse 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. Well, they would do that because of their views, false views, the erroneous views, uh, that was characteristic of the Gnostics. And without going back through that again. And thus, when they took the position they did on Christ, then they denied the very thing the scripture said about him. Remember, John starts out this epistle by saying that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. He was flesh and blood. In John 1, 1 and 2, and 14, he makes it clear this is God in the flesh. Through him, God created all things. He is God, and he's God in the flesh. You go around saying God wasn't in the flesh, and that's what these Gnostics were doing. And you're alive. And he said, you've had the wherewithal. Now employ it, exercise it. Remember when the writer of Hebrews uh, admonished and rebuked those teachers say, when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need again the one teach you the first principles, the offers of God, you can't eat meat, you got to drink milk. You've had the time, you haven't used the time correctly. Well, the time was you've had the knowledge, you haven't examined things in the light of it. You haven't learned how to use it. So no wonder you don't recognize what's right and wrong. Well, that not only comes today to us with the completed written word, and how to use it, but it had to do back then when the word was being revealed. It had to do back then, even if you had an unction from the Spirit. Whatever miraculous gift you had, you could neglect it, you could abuse it, you could misuse it. So we need to understand that much about even the use of miraculous things in the early church. People think to think that miracles were the sum and substance of everything spiritual. But it evidently wasn't. From what the scriptures record, you had to keep a right attitude about them, know their purpose, know how to use them, will to use them, and use them for right purposes. Certainly wasn't happening at Corinth. You took a letter from the very spirit that gave those gifts to the members of the church at Corinth to correct them in their misuse of it. Who's a liar? Anybody that says Jesus doesn't come in the flesh. And who is that? Well, these people you're addressing right now. What is he? He's an antichrist. And if you deny the son, you deny the father also. So to deny the son, you deny the father. He's already established that much earlier. The way to the father is through the son. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father but by me, John 14, 6. None of those things are forgotten in the writing of John here. And in applying it to the false teachers, that he's dealing with and one of these brethren to be aware of. Please realize, keep it in your mind, these are not people who don't know the truth. These are not people outside of the church. These are brethren, and they need this to keep them on the straight and narrow way, that their joy may be full, that they might remain in fellowship with God, even as the apostles are, and that's why he's right. So, Verse 23, whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Now, I recognize the latter part of that verse is in italics, but it certainly states the truth in the matter. And it doesn't change a thing in the world. Uh, when you, by the way, remember, you, I think everybody knows it, but when you have something in italics like that, it means it was in the original manuscripts. And it stands to reason here that if uh, you deny the son, you don't have the father. Well, it works both ways, doesn't it? And that's the idea of that uh, the translators are making sure that, that, that they got old. So let that, therefore, therefore, in a lot of what I've just been telling you, you might say, are you listening? Have you got it? If you have, let's use it. Let is the force of a commandment. Therefore, refers back to the reasoning done and the facts established. Let that Therefore, abide in you. Well, you have an unction from the Spirit. 
Let it abide in you means you've got to keep it in you. Remember, Peter said, the second epistle I write unto you, in which both I stir up your pure mind and way of remembrance. Obviously, with miraculous gifts and an unction from the Father, you still must be reminded. If not, explain 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. A letter from the Spirit through Paul to the church at Corinth, correcting them, and yet they had every one of the miraculous gifts that are listed right there in 1 Corinthians 12. So we need to understand more about that. So let that therefore abide in you. Well, what is it? Which ye have heard from the beginning, from the beginning of your life in Christ, what you heard to be converted, what you heard that gave you the wherewithal to become a Christian. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And there it is. The access to the Father through the soul. But it's the gospel of Christ, the glad tidings of Christ that saves them. So that's where God's place is power to save, Romans 1 16. And you've got to retain it. So, and this is the promise, verse 25, that he had promised us in eternal life. Well, Romans 8 and 24 says that uh, hope saves us. The expectation of going to heaven is part of what saves us. I don't know about. I think I know. We don't think of it enough. That is, uh, if I die tonight, I have the hope of heaven. Well, that's not a wish. That's a reality. God's wanting that to be a reality. And he wants them to know how to measure themselves so they know whether they have it. So God's made a promise. You love me, you keep my commandments, you're going to heaven. That's pretty plain, seems to me. So look at verse 26. These things have I written. So he's written all these things up to this point. And what's he writing about? Those who seduce you. So all he said here, the context of it, the immediate context, I've written all this so you can meet this doctrine head on and refute it and recognize it and refute it. So I've written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But I hear people saying, oh, let's not call names. Let's not point out that Brother so and so is teaching false doctrine. Here's the doctrine. Here's when that's false. Well, they need to go uh, read verse 26. John says, I've written this whole letter to you so you'd recognize those that would lead you away from what you know, those that seduce you. Think about that. They seduce you. They're, they're pulling you away by their false doctrine from the truth that you know. Don't let that happen. And yet when you go to 1 Timothy 4, you will see that those brethren there that became false teachers Came false teachers because of seduction. They loved what they heard that was false and they embraced it. Well, our time's getting away from us here, uh, but I would sure emphasize verse 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. You cannot be for the truth and those who preach it, and not be against error and those who preach it. That's part of being faithful. And if that tells you otherwise, you're not in the truth about any apart from John right now. It's just the way that it is. It's the fact of the matter, and it doesn't change. Well, we're close here, and we'll close as we usually do with a prayer to our Heavenly Father. Our holy and righteous Father, we humbly bow before thy great throne. Thankful again to be together in the midst of this very busy week. This time quickly passes by. And we pray that thou wouldst help us to hold these things dear to us and practice the truth in every day that we live, that we might recognize those who are on the side of truth, who love it and obey it, and those who oppose it and have gone out from us. Help us to worship thee always in spirit and in truth, and to serve thee faithfully, offering our bodies as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service. For the sick, the afflicted, the orphan, especially these of the church, Help us to love each other as brethren. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever. In Christ's name, amen.